Hey guys! Today we're reviewing the book Notre Dame vs. the Klan, How the Fighting Irish Defeated the Ku Klux Klan by Todd Tucker. Now I know I'm going to be slightly biased because I grew up in a household where Notre Dame was a major focal point. We all sat and watched the Notre Dame games, we had family members who went to Notre Dame, and as of this upload of the video, my brother is actually a student at Notre Dame. He is a senior residing in Zom House which he absolutely loves. Shout out to Zom. Um, my father did go to Notre Dame for a short period of time before tearing his knee, but I love the stories he told us of Notre Dame and the history. So this book was very interesting to me to read more into the history. Now I'd always grew up hearing the stories of Father uh, Ted Hesburgh, uh, who was the head of Notre Dame during the Civil Rights Movement. He walked with Martin Luther King Jr. He was a major figurehead, so much so that in 1987 they named the library after him. And I never knew that Father Hesburgh wasn't the first to start the civil rights movement or fight against the Klan. Unfortunately, Father Hesburgh passed away this year before his 100th birthday. Uh, he died February 26, 2015. Now, the university is absolutely gorgeous. I want to point something out real quick. This is what's known as the Golden Dome. It is one of the central uh, focal points in the university and it's absolutely gorgeous to see. I've seen it so many times, but I still love it. Also, you can see um, the campus, Touchdown Jesus, as well as the Grotto, which are both beautiful places. Now, again, if you're looking at any historical book, you need to look at the author. So I looked to see who Todd Tucker was. He actually was a student of Notre Dame. He graduated with his bachelor's and served in the U.S. Navy uh, in the Nuclear Submarine Force. This is not his first book. Uh, he published a book prior to this about the University of Notre Dame. It's called Notre Dame Game Day, which was published in 2000. Now, Notre Dame vs. the Klan was published in 2004 by Loyola Press, which is a very um, prestigious press uh, publishing company when it comes to, um, what's the word I'm looking for, peer-reviewed books. Now Tucker opens his book with the date that many Notre Dame students will not recognize. It's May 1924. I asked my brother and my father and they looked at me like I was nuts because it didn't mean anything to them. The book looks first at the 1920s. So let's first examine this. During the 1920s, you have the revival of the Ku Klux Klan. The first Klan had already fallen. The man who started the Klan actually became a drunkard and once this happened, a lot of people left the Klan. Once D.W. Griffith's movie Birth of a Nation started playing across the, nation, uh, across the United States, you start to see Klan revivals. This is where we're going to see the Burning Cross and Stone Mountain. You also have, during this time in the South, a Jewish pencil factory manager, Leo Frank, who will be lynched for the rape and murder of a worker. Her name was Mary Fagan. She was 13 years old. But it turned out Frank was not the actual murderer. Apparently, in the South, the Klan hated Jews more than they did Blacks because they took the testimony of an African-American um, janitor over Frank's wife saying that he was at home. Uh, the Klan didn't like Catholics either. The Klan was pretty much against anything that wasn't white and Protestant. So the Klan felt like the Catholics were a large threat. And they also felt like Notre Dame was a large threat because it was a Catholic university. For all those who don't know where Notre Dame is, it's in South Bend, Indiana. And it's far away from the South, as Tuck Tucker points out several times in the book. Now going back to the date, May 19, 1924, the narrative opens with a student named Bill Footy who was studying late at Sophomore Hall when he heard the call by somebody saying they got one of the boys downtown, meaning one of the Ku Klux members had been cornered by other Notre Dame students. This led to the first conflict in the book between the Klan and students that Tucker will describe. The Klan had already attacked the university and the students using the press, and the students chose to push back and fight instead of turn the other cheek. 
The students actually used physical force to teach the Klansmen a lesson in Tucker's description. During the altercation, one of the Klansmen dropped the newspaper the Klan had been spreading around town. It was the Klan's newspaper known as the Fiery Cross. This newspaper attacked the university, calling Catholicism un-American, which had upset many of the students, along with attacking the Irish. Now, the Irish was a favorite target of the Klan because they were seen as drunkards and also as Catholics. Many Protestants had the term Irish interchangeably used for Catholic because of uh, the large population of Roman Catholics in Ireland. Now, Tucker Start states that Footy, Bill Footy would have would have probably ignored the Klan like many of the other students, but he just couldn't take it anymore. After the Klan's candidates won out the May 1924 Republican primary, this incensed the students so much that it started a brawl in South Bend, Indiana between Notre Dame students and the Klan. In the end, the students were dragged off to the courthouse where they were met by the president of the university, Father J. Hugo O'Donnell. There was another man with him as well, Father Walsh, who wasn't very pleased at any of this. Uh, Tucker will address Walsh's story later on, but Walsh marched across the field to where the students who had been arrested for rioting were. All the students realized that they were in big trouble since Father Walsh looked totally disappointed in them. Walsh is actually a war veteran and he had tried to talk the students down from this, but it all came to a head with his prediction that violence would happen when the Klan announced that they would hold a rally in South Bend. Walsh had actually served as a military chaplain and the students respected him very much. Now, after getting the students out of the courthouse and back to the university, Father Walsh, in Tucker's words, said, chastising these students, whenever challenges may have been offered tonight to you, your patriotism, whether insulted, may have been affronted to your religion, you cannot, you can show your loyalty to Notre Dame and South Bend by ignoring all threats. I said Tucker will explain in the author's notes of this book at the end because there's something wonky about the story. You see, most of this story is actually made up. He explains on page 19 that he came up with the story because he knew Bill Footy's actual grandson. Mark Footy, who was with him in Cavanaugh Hall when he attended Notre Dame. When he had actually approached Mark Footy, it was years after and they'd actually lost touch. Footy's grandson actually asked why his grandfather was pictured in a Ku Klux Klan robe that Bill had stolen off one of the members. So Tucker went into the story, but this is not who he wanted to focus on. He even says this in the author's note. He says a lot of the dialogue that was used in the prologue was an example of what he thought the students probably felt. And he wants to make this short, that people who are reading this book don't take this for historical fact. He also says there was not many first person accounts for him to use. Now getting into the book, Tucker really wanted to explore Father Matthew Walsh. You see, he introduces Matthew Walsh in 1893 when he's attending Holy Cross Brothers before heading to Notre Dame. Tucker uses Walsh's story to illustrate the early years of conflict at the university, finally culminating in the fight with the Klan. You see, Walsh had arrived at Notre Dame in 1899, where there's a fight between two major fathers who led the university. The first being Father John Zom, Zom House, and the second being Father Andrew Morrissey. Now, if you're a Notre Dame alumni, fan, student, you recognize these two names for one simple reason. They're both dorm halls. Zom House, which was established in 1937, um, where my brother lives, is still on campus. The same with Morrissey Hall, which was established in 18, 1925. Now, the two fathers had different views of what Notre Dame should be. And Walsh tried to stay out of this political turmoil between the two fathers. He privately agreed with Father Zom, who argued the university needed to do away with the preparatory school and the trade school and focus solely on academics and university standards. Um, now, after Walsh graduates, he continues with his PhD in history and finally becomes a priest in 1907. 
Um, and Tucker will also address where the nickname the Fighting Irish comes into play for the Irish. If any of you have ever wondered this like I have, I really never got a straight answer. So it's the nickname started in the 1920s, which he points out was a kind of a surprise. This was due to the fact that there was only 155 residents in South Bend who were Irish. They were completely outnumbered by Russians, Swedes, Belgians, Belgians, and Italians. This was more reflected upon the fan base and the students that came to this school. Again, the word Irish became interchangeable between the Protestants who believed that all Irish were Catholics and therefore all Catholics were Irish. So Tucker starts to go into the history of the clan, starting in chapter three. He talks about trying to watch D.W. Griffith's movie, Birth of a Nation, to give him some insight into why the clan popped up in the way it did. And he actually kind of had the same reaction I did. I watched this movie once and I was totally surprised at how lacking in verbiage and words it is. It's a silent film, I know, but there's not much explanation. Um, but he does point out this is also more true than Thomas Dixon's book that it's based off of, The Klansman. Um, but he says the score, and I will agree with him on this, the score of Birth of a Nation is pretty profound. And it kind of gives him somewhat of an understanding, but he doesn't quite understand why the clan came to be. Now, Tucker will finally move back to Notre Dame's conflict in Chapter 4, where Walsh has become an army chaplain. This is actually a really funny chapter to read because it shows the different view of the religions. When Walsh is asked a question that was posed to other ministers and other priests, he answers totally differently than the Lutheran minister or the Southern Baptist priest. And I won't ruin that part for you because I do say you have to read that because it's actually pretty funny. Now, Tucker will then turn to Walsh returning in 1919 to Notre Dame and him trying to start to take over the school and try to lead the university in a new way. Now, Tucker is still setting up the conflict in South Bend between the Klan and the students. And so much so, the next chapter is titled The Klan Takes Over Indiana, starting with the conflict in the Republican primary. During this chapter, he brings another person he knew from Notre Dame into the fight. Um, it's actually a psychologist, a clinical psychology professor named Dr. David Smith, uh, who he had emailed about examining a man named D.C. Steffens, who was the leader of the Indiana Ku Klux Klan. Now, as I talked about um, Steffens, there's many interesting points, but I will not ruin them. But before Tucker leaves, Dr. Smith tells him that his grandfather graduated in 1992, uh, 1922 from the University of Notre Dame, came into conflict with the Klan, and also was a charter member in the Knights of Columbus. For those of you who don't know what this group is, this is a counteractive group to the KKK. The Knights of Columbus were founded in 1882 by uh, Father Mitch Michael McGreeve as a Catholic response to the KKK to kind of combat them. Now, Tucker talks about how the Klan started to use the newspapers to go against the universities, trying to attack them. And when Father Walsh gets back, Walsh tries to stop the conflict. He tries to get the students just to leave it alone and hopes that the Klan will just go away. But Walsh sees the growing power of the Klan through the speeches and the targeting of staff. And starting on page uh, 122, Tucker chronicles in the exchange between a student and a Klansman. One thing that really stood out to me was on page 123, when Tucker starts with an exchange of a man asking the Klan this question, how do you feel about Catholics? Can Catholics be good Americans? Tucker then states what the Klansman's response was, which was, we believe Catholics can be good people, but we don't believe they can be good Americans. This to me shows how the Klan would adjust what they were saying to get most people on their side. Now, Father Walsh is going through a lot of turmoil because you have another faction of priests fighting to see, okay, who's going to be the one who leads us. And unbeknownst to Walsh, Father Kavanaugh has set his mind on what he's going to do. Father Kavanaugh arranges 
a letter to all Notre Dame alumni in South Bend in Chicago demanding the stoppage of donations to the American Unity League because he felt that they were not doing enough to help the university. And this leads to Walsh trying to deal with this because Father O'Donnell is the one who runs the American Unity League who's trying to create a bridge between the students and the clan. Now, I'm not gonna ruin any more of the book. You just have to read it. It is actually a really good read. But I will tell you in the middle of the book, you will find pictures showing William Footy in a torn clan's robe, along with pictures of the founder, Edward Soren, uh, Father Walsh in his army uniform, the four horsemen, which if you're a Notre Dame fan, you know who they are, and Newt Rockney. But I will say it is a very easy read. If you just want something light to read to learn a little bit more about Notre Dame, definitely pick it up. I highly suggest it if you were a student. I'd only give it a four out of five on my scale just because Tucker does include a lot of information that is repetitory. Now the next book review I will be doing is Hitler's Holy Relics, which will be next week. But if you want to find this book, you can find it on Amazon for $18. If you want to check out more information on the University of Notre Dame, check out the book Notre Dame and the Civil War, March Marching Onwards to Victory by James Schmidt, Loyal Sons, the, the Story of the Four Horsemen and Notre Dame Football, 1924's Championship by Jim Lethby, or Coach for a Nation, The Life and Times of Newt Rockne by the same author. Now, if you want to know more about the Klan, check out Citizen Klansmen, the Ku Klux Klan of Indiana, 1921 to 1928 by Lenoy J. Moore, Behind the Mask of Chivalry, The Making of the Second Ku Klux Klan by Nancy McLean, or Hooded America, The History of the Klan, by David Chapman. Now, if you want to take on a different view of the Klan, check out Women of the Klan, Race and Gender in the 1920s by Kathleen Blee, B-L-E-E. -E. Um, and next week also is going to be, as I said before, Hitler's Holy Relics, a true story of Nazi plunder and the race to recover the crown jewels of the Holy Roman Empire by Sidney Kirkpatrick. Also next week, we have D-Day coming up June 6th. That's why I'm doing this book. Leave a like. Give me a message. Tell me what you think. What book have you recently read that was a historical book? Bye, guys.